it's the first episode of a series called Geopolitics and Behavior Analysis. The topic that I'm discussing today with my guest, the Russian invasion of Ukraine, is quite contentious and for understandable reasons. If one's own country is attacked, of course you do whatever you can to defend it. Questions come later. Questions like what really caused the invasion or an analytical investigation of the events leading up to the invasion are not relevant to the Ukrainian people while their homes and livelihoods are being destroyed, while relatives are getting killed fighting the Russians or by bombs and drone strikes. It's a bad situation and it has the very real potential to get much, much worse. But wars don't happen by accident. Wars are not a bug in the system. Believe it or not, wars happen by design. And that's where behavior analysis comes in. If you want to persuade people without them knowing that you do so, you have to apply manipulative strategies and these are known to social science. The best way to manipulate people is via their emotions, via their unconscious and instinctive drives. Facts don't change minds, emotions do. And the most effective emotion to manipulate thoughts and feelings is fear. So ask yourself, what does it mean when a leader speaks of Armageddon? Ask yourself which emotion he wants to instill. But what's even more important, ask yourself why? What does he want to achieve? The next thing you have to do if you want to manipulate people is to control the flow of information. From an analytical perspective, there are two strategies that are quite obviously being applied here. The first is that the combined output of the Western media is synchronized. It doesn't matter in which country you live, with rare exceptions you get exactly the same information. What's even worse is the fact that you get the false impression that the whole world, maybe with the exception of China, Iran and North Korea, are united in the opposition against Putin. In reality only a small minority of the 193 countries that we have today is us the Western world. To put this in perspective, BRICS alone, that's Brazil, Russia, India, China and South Africa account for 41% of the world population. Contrast this with the 16% of the 30 or so NATO countries. So 41% against 16. The second strategy to control the flow of information is to simply limit it. Limit the information to only that type of information that fits the mainstream narrative. Dissenting voices, if they arise, have to be cut short. Professor Jeffrey Sachs, my guest today, is such a dissenting voice. Like Noam Chomsky and Professor Mersheimer, he looks at the historical and geopolitical context that led to the war in Ukraine and he was, quite literally, cut off when speaking at some public events. Professor Sachs is a renowned economist at the Columbia University and director of the Center for Sustainable Development. He was an economic advisor to both Gorbachev and Yeltsin in the turbulent phase during and after the collapse of the Soviet Empire. As you will see in a moment, he can truthfully claim that he was in the room when it all happened. But it came with a cost. Those who look at geopolitical context the way Jeffrey Sachs, Noam Chomsky and Professor Mersheimer do when it comes to the war in Ukraine are often accused of peddling Putin's arguments. If you think about it, that's a bit like saying a surgeon studying the root causes of cancer is promoting cancer. This line of argumentation is just another way of controlling the flow of information by making it illegitimate. And as I said at the beginning, I know this is a contentious topic and what Professor Sachs says may go against what you believe to be true. I can only hope that you're someone with an open and curious mind, why else would you be here on my channel? And if you stick around, after the interview I will explain how you can avoid some of the common pitfalls when it comes to manipulation. There we go. Professor Sachs, uh, thank you so much for joining today from Vienna. It's really appreciated. You have a very busy schedule. I have seen some recent interviews uh, with you. So it's really doubly appreciated that you make time today for this uh, little conversation. Okay. My, my pleasure. We're, we're going to be talking about important things. You're absolutely right. We saw in the introduction that you led a really remarkable life, yeah? not just as a passive observer, but as an active participant, right? Now, and feel free to correct me if I'm wrong. So the, some of the key points were, of course, that you, are, that you were economic advisor in Poland. More importantly, I believe you were also economic advisor in the last year of uh, Gorbachev in the f and in the first two years of Yeltsin. 
And I have directly a little uh, segue for you. I heard a very interesting story from you in regards to you joining a meeting in the Kremlin with Yeltsin, where Yeltsin told you that he just dissolved the Soviet Union. Maybe, maybe you want to elaborate on this one. Yeah, that was an unusual moment. <laughs> uh, we were indeed in the Kremlin in, in a, a huge uh, office room, uh, and uh, President Yeltsin came from the far door, uh, walked across the room to our group, which was about 10 economists invited to help advise uh, the economic team of President Yeltsin. The president sat down and his first words were, I can tell you we have just ended the Soviet Union. <laughs> and then he pointed to the back door. He said, in that next room, I was meeting with the heads of the military and they have agreed to the dissolution of the Soviet Union. So those were the first words that we heard. Absolutely unbelievable. How old were you then, if I may ask? Uh, that was uh, 1991, December 91. So I was uh, 37 uh, at the time. Yeah. Did you, did you realize at this specific moment in time the significance of what you just witnessed? Uh, yes, <laughs> I absolutely did. <laughs> you know, that was uh, my whole uh, life up to that moment, like all of us on the planet, was the Cold War, the Soviet uh, Union, uh, and to be there in the Kremlin and to be hearing from the president of Russia this news, uh, not to be reading it uh, in a newspaper, but uh, to be hearing it the moment it happened. Uh, I have to say uh, it, it was a moment that has stuck with me for this uh, 31 years since. Yeah. Is there any comparable moment in, in your career? Comparable to that? I, I, I've had a few uh, extraordinary moments. Uh, um, and I was very active <coughs> in the transition in Poland, uh, also the political transition. So there were moments there that were absolutely poignant as well. There have been a few, uh, but uh, the, the one with President Yeltsin was uh, definitely way up there. I can, I wanted to say I can imagine, but in, in, in reality, I can't. Okay, good. So you are also a prolific writer. I stopped counting about, by about 20 books, right? And I picked two out because I find they are really relevant to the current situation. Yeah. The first is uh, To Move the World, uh, GFK's Request for Peace. It's so much related to what's happening today. Cuba crisis, keyword Cuba crisis, which I know that you studied in depth. And the second one that I picked out is A New Foreign Policy Beyond American Exceptional Exceptionalism. Right? Also very much related to what's going on today because the tendency of the general tendency today is to take events out of context as if uh, Putin just woke up one early morning and said, mm, today I'm going to invade Ukraine, right? So these were the two uh, books. And it was, of course, The Age of Globalization, also absolutely worth, uh, worth a read. Um, but again, uh, I think the first two uh, are very related to, um, to the current situation. So if you... The, the if you I was going to say that the, the, the point you make uh, about what we're told is exactly right. Almost every day, maybe every day, we're told in the mainstream press that uh, the war in Ukraine is an unprovoked war that started on February 24th, 2022. Uh, this neglects the fact that the war actually has been going on since 2014, uh, though not with this intensity. And it absolutely aims to separate us from any historical context. The word unprovoked is, uh, of course, a tendentious word. It's a, it, it's a word with a narrative purpose. It's false. Uh, of course, there are reasons for this war. There are antecedents. There were warnings, uh, none of which were heeded by the United States. But in any event, this is not a war that came out of the blue just because suddenly that day uh, President Putin wanted to recreate the Russian Empire, which is more or less how we're told. But uh, rather, this is part of politics and, and geopolitics. And uh, the two books that you mentioned, uh, To Move the World, JFK's Quest for Peace and uh, A New Foreign Policy, 
both of them are my uh, uh, attempt to explain what it means to cooperate versus uh, enter war. Cooperation is the better outcome. It requires uh, skills. It, it requires an understanding of the context. Uh, it requires damn good luck, I have to say, because in 1962 with the Cuban Missile Crisis, President Kennedy's advisors, almost everyone, said we need to go to war. We need to attack Cuba uh, to take out the Soviet missile bases that are <coughs> being established there. It would have ended the world, most likely. Everything that the CIA believed about those missiles was wrong. Everything the CIA claimed to know about how many Soviet troops and so forth was wrong. Uh, and in the end, Kennedy uh, intuited his way to a peaceful outcome based on compromise and diplomacy, by the way. Uh, and that was critical. And I wrote about the aftermath of the Cuban Missile Crisis in my book, because in 1963, after the world was spared by the actions of Kennedy and Khrushchev, uh, both the leaders realized we were just absolutely gambling with Armageddon, which is the term that a great historian used for a wonderful book about the Cuban Missile Crisis written a couple of years ago, Martin Sherwin, who has since passed away. But they realized that this was an impossible way to live on in this world. And the following year, they negotiated uh, the Partial Nuclear Test Ban Treaty, which was significant not only in its own right, but showing that the two sides could reach a diplomatic agreement, could pull back from the abyss, could reach an understanding. Alas, the way that things go in this world, Kennedy was assassinated soon afterwards, and quite possibly because of his peace overtures and his intention to pull out of Vietnam. There are many theories, uh, as one knows, about Kennedy's assassination, but it could well have come from parts of the U.S. government or rogue uh, parts of uh, the government that objected to his peace initiatives. And Khrushchev was uh, dumped the next year uh, by the Soviet side, and the nuclear arms race continued. So finding cooperation is not easy. Uh, it's not necessarily permanent. Uh, it requires ongoing active diplomacy. And the book in 2019 that I wrote, A New Foreign Policy, basically says <clears throat> the U.S. attempt to maintain uh, dominance or hegemony or uh, uh, its unipolarity, uh, as is sometimes said, is extremely dangerous because the rest of the world doesn't want the United States to be the sole leader. Most of the rest of the world wants a multipolar world. And I argued that there are ways for cooperation to be the dominant mode of international statecraft and that we could live under the UN Charter and that the US foreign policy was not only, I think, doomed to fail, but is absolutely dangerous. Uh, and I think this war that we're in is yet another sign of how dangerous uh, this U.S. foreign policy is. Very briefly, uh, and I, I don't want to preempt, yeah, in regards to Cuba, it, it's such a good example because the, the situation is so similar, right? It's the closeness of, you know, the closest of the, the demarcation line. It's the nuclear arms proliferation in the direct border region with Russia, right? Imagine what almost would have happened or what almost had happened uh, if Kennedy and Khrushchev wouldn't have negotiated with each other as they did. Yeah. Most people don't realize, you know, we were hanging on the hair in regards to a, um, a nuclear war. There, there's so much to learn about the yeah. Cuban Missile Crisis, which is 60 years right now. Um, one of the things is uh, neither leader wanted to stumble into such a crisis. 
This is the damn thing about the world, which is the world's very dangerous when it's filled with nuclear weapons because stupid policies lead to more stupid policies, lead to other stupid policies, and so forth. When Castro's revolution occurred, the United States decided we have to throw this guy out. Uh, and especially when Castro started to warm up to the Soviet Union in 1960, Eisenhower uh, and the CIA decided to, to invade Cuba. Uh, this is not exactly what uh, the U.S. says, oh, countries have the choice to choose their, <laughs> their partners. Uh, the U.S. Uh, always maintains the doctrine, you stay out of our backyard, you stay out of our neighborhood. And uh, one terrible set of uh, events after another led to the invasion, the Bay of Pigs invasion uh, by the U.S. Uh, in the spring of 1961, it was a massive failure. Uh, it stoked another round of uh, arms race. And Khrushchev said, look, uh, the U.S. has put missiles into Turkey right on our border. It's invaded Cuba. We need to teach them a lesson. We'll put missiles into Cuba. And when he told this to the Soviet foreign minister, Gromyko, uh, Gromyko said, well, that'll be war. Khrushchev said, no, this isn't about war. This is just to teach a lesson to the Americans about their own medicine. Of course, it almost led to the end of the world. And so what leaders do, they don't calibrate. They don't think properly. It's so dangerous when each side provokes. But just to come to the uh, many analogies, you know, the United States has said since 1823, Stay out of our, quote, backyard. Uh, they doctrine. didn't use that word in the Wonderful. Monroe Doctrine. And that meant all of the Americas, which the United States said to Europe, don't meddle in our region. So the U.S. hasn't exactly taken the line that each country has its own choice. Now, I think it's, you know, the U.S. has done some terrible things in the Americas over the years. But th the fact of the matter is that... The U.S. felt, U.S. leaders felt in uh, 1962 that, you know, when the Soviet Union <laughs> put in uh, a military, military bases and uh, offensive nuclear weapons, that this was, of course, an absolute threat to U.S. security that was so significant that uh, it would risk global Armageddon over it. But when Russia said repeatedly, don't move NATO up to our border. And in fact, following promises made by the United States and Germany in 1990. And we come there. We will, we will come there, oh, Professor Oh, sure, Sachs. absolutely. You're, you're preempting. I have a nice oh, list. Oh, sorry. Of, you're preempting me here. But I, I would no. like to discuss this a little bit more in detail. Yeah. Yes, please. But before we do, on a personal note, yeah, I have seen a couple of interviews where you were rudely interrupted or even cut off. Yeah. The most recent one was, I think, two weeks ago at the Athens Democracy Forum, right, where the moderator, I think it was from the Washington Post, uh, uh, literally said, Jeffrey, stop. I am the moderator. It's enough. I mean, can you imagine? I mean, yeah. Then uh, on Bloomberg, Bloomberg TV, same thing, right? In a, in a pretty rude way, people who run out of arguments, Right, that, that's my that's my interpretation of here, here. Run out of arguments, find no other way than than to to rudely cut you off. So my point is, my question is, how because on those interview I see you being quite calm. So how internally, how are you dealing with it? I mean, that, that must, I mean, that, that must be a difficult situation. You're on a public stage on television, sometimes in the, in front of an audience, and you're cut down like that. So how do you deal with this? Well, let me say on, on the Athens one, uh, it, it's it's a little bit uh, true. I speak a lot, so uh, and I talk too much. Uh, you know, uh, not not I'm not talking about the content. I'm talking about the time. So I think the moderator there uh, from the New York Times was basically saying, "Give give others a chance." But he but he cut me off at a crucial moment when I was making an important point that I wanted to make. But in any event. I put that one aside. The other one is is was pretty uh, pretty humorous in a way and pretty frustrating because uh, I was invited to a show that I've been on a number of times. I had the 
audacity to say that I thought the United States had been the country that uh, that uh, took out the uh, Nord Stream pipeline, something I believe to this moment. Uh, maybe the UK did it together with the US, but definitely this was a, a, a US job together with some allied countries. This wasn't Russia. It, and it's pretty obvious, uh, actually, for a lot of reasons that that's the case. Um, but when I said it, oh, that violated absolutely uh, you know, the, the party line in the United States. And I know that uh, these interviewers, you know, they have uh, earpieces that where the producers say, get this guy to stop, get this guy to stop. That's outrageous. We can't have this. So I just watched the faces of my uh, interviewers <laughs> and uh, th they stopped me cold. Usually I'm on for, you know, half an hour on the show. It was about five minutes. And then one of them just went on a, a, an attack for five minutes. They didn't cut me off the Zoom so I could watch the show, but I couldn't participate. And he just went after me personally for five minutes. This is an ignoramus. He knows nothing. Why do we have an economist talking about this, despite the fact that I've been in global diplomacy for decades, actually, uh, and uh, involved with these countries? So it's disheartening when we're talking about such important issues that we can't have an open discussion about them. And there's a lot of lying that's going on. You know, governments lie. Uh, even Churchill said the truth is so precious that it has to be surrounded by a bodyguard of lies. Uh, in wartime, governments lie. Okay, we can understand that. It's a game they're playing. They're using these lies for strategic purposes. But the media used to, as I understood it, take a critical view to this and say, okay, the government said this, but now we're going to look a little more deeply at that. That's what a media in a democracy really should be doing. Not just saying that some unnamed U.S. official said it was Russia that did it, that kind of thing. There should be an open skepticism because we're a democracy. Governments lie, so the public needs to have an understanding what's true, what isn't true? And we are engaged in so many lies right now. Uh, I think the Nord Stream is an example. By the way, a big consequence for Europe because somebody blew up critical infrastructure, yeah. de deprived Europe of uh, its uh, a, a crucial energy source. And then when the Swedes investigated, by the way, uh, they say, oh, for national security reasons, we can't even share our findings with Denmark and Germany. Huh? Yeah. What could that mean? You know, that's pretty weird. So this is an example. Uh, another one is uh, the shelling before me, of the... Before, oh, me, before, me, before we move on from Nord Stream, because that's a topic which is highly, highly interesting for one particular reason, because we don't hear anything anymore. Yeah, it's just gone. Yeah. So I took, I took the liberty. I took a couple of statements from U.S. officials. Yeah. Let's start with Joe Biden. Yeah. I'm, I'm reading from a script here. He said, if Russia invades Ukraine, there will be no longer, there will no longer be a Nord Stream 2. We will bring an end to it. And the, the reporter was so puzzled. She said, huh? How is that possible? I mean, it, it's, it's, it's a project between Germany and, and, and Russia. And she had, and he said, I promise you, we will, able, we will be able to do that. That was Joe, that was Joe Biden. Then we have, uh, U.S. Secretary of State Lincoln. Yeah. Nord Stream sabotage is also a tremendous opportunity to once and for all remove the, the dependency on Russian energy. Where we, when we later uh, will be discussing NATO, I will come to the very famous infamous statement from the first secretary, uh, general of, of the NATO, of the NATO. I, I keep it for later. Yeah. Then Victoria yeah. Nuland, Assistant Secretary of State. Yeah. Also infamous for, for her F the EU statement, right? If Russia invades Ukraine one way or another, Nord Stream will not move forward. I have another one. Senator Ron Johnson. Yeah. He gets even a step, a step further because it almost appears that he's calling for the sabotage when he says, we are taking action that will prevent it from ever becoming operational. Let's not forget the former Polish foreign uh, minister, Radek uh, Sierkowski, which said literally on a tweet, thank you, USA, with a big picture of, of Nord Stream. I have a last one. 
asked, it's Sarah Wagenknecht. She is a German par parliamentarian and she actually requested from the German government information, right? I have the original document here. The requested, also the, the reply from the German government was the requested information can't be provided due to the third party rule, whatever it is, for international cooperation of intelligence services. They stated that the requested information is so sensitive that the, that in the, that the interest of the state supersedes the right of information from the parliament. I mean, you have to let this sink in what it really means. Yeah. If, if, if they think that Russia blew up that uh, Nord Stream 1 and 2, it would be all over the place. They would, they would broadcast it with all means possible. So what, and yeah, that's a question for you. What potentially could be so sensitive in regards to this uh, sabotage? that they do the opposite, right? They do not communicate anything, even to the, to the German parliament. So what's the I, take? I think, it's I think it's obvious the United States did it, uh, perhaps together with the UK. But this is obvious. Uh, we, we have the, the motive, the means, the opportunity, the statements, and the behavior of uh, the uh, governments uh, in Europe. It's, it's obvious. If there's something different, someone should say it and explain it. Uh, we apparently have, it's, you know, not verified, but we also apparently have tweets uh, that were uh, collected also by Russian intelligence and so forth, showing that the UK was involved, you know, or not tweets, I think it's a, a, an iPhone message, <coughs> apparently reportedly from Liz Truss. It, it, this, this is very, very clear. If the president says we have our means, and I've been, you know, living and watching this for decades, the United States destroys infrastructure of other countries. That's not an unusual thing to do. It's just that we're, we're trying to be democracies. We're trying to understand. We're trying to save ourselves from Armageddon. We're trying to understand what's really happening. And it's not acceptable in my view, that governments just lie or shut their mouths about this without explaining the realities of what's going on. And what does it mean? Now, let's just be more, more, more prudent. Yeah? What would it mean if one or multiple NATO countries attack the critical infrastructure? Because let's not be fooled about this. This is critical infrastructure or was critical infrastructure, not only for Germany, but for Europe. If one or multiple NATO countries attack another NATO country, what, 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 what does that mean? Well, what it means is that we are in a terrible war right now, very dangerous between the United States and Russia. Uh, the U.S. is using whatever means, uh, not all so far, but we're on a path of escalation to nuclear war. It means that something as shocking as blowing up International infrastructure is part of it, but even more shocking than blaming it on the Russians. Now, that is absolutely dangerous to do something so provocative and then blame it on the Russians. But that's par for the course. Uh, one of the things I was about to mention is the extremely dangerous shelling of the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant. Now, the Russians seized that power plant early in the war, and the Ukrainians have been trying to recapture it. And part of recapturing it has been shelling the power plant, which is a no-no. Do not shell a nuclear power plant. Thank you. But our media say each side accuses the other of shelling the nuclear power plant. The one side controls it. The other side is ready, trying to retake it. Who's actually doing the shelling? The one that controls it? No. The one that's trying to retake it. But our media are just fed nonsense by government. If we had the gumption to say, Ukraine is shelling the nuclear power plant, stop it. You're our ally, but that is dangerous. Stop that dangerous behavior the world would be a lot safer. Recently, we have the shock, shock that Russia has discontinued the grain export agreement out of the Black Sea ports. But there was an attack by the UK intelligence combined with Ukraine on the Sevastopol Russian fleet. Do our media discuss that attack? 
No, they just have the voices. How evil that Russia uh, does uh, uh, what it's doing to stop the agreement. We cannot get out of this mess if all we're doing is attacking the other without understanding of what we are doing. You know, I often talk about Jesus's foreign policy advice, which is why do you point to the moat in the other eye when you have a beam in your own eye from the Gospels? Uh, and the point is, if all we're doing is attacking Russia, even falsely, when we know that it's not Russia doing it, then what do, what do people expect to happen other than the worst kinds of outcomes? We need truth to get out of this crisis. To come to be a bit more specific, so I think I heard <coughs> you talking about the evidence of America's involvement in regards to the sabotage of Nord Stream 1 and 2. Could you elaborate? Yes. Well, I, I think the evidence is only circumstantial because they don't parade it in public. But the evidence is the pronouncements by the U.S. officials, the promise to do it, the fact of this behavioral response that uh, the allied countries won't even talk about it with each other, much less uh, even with their own parliamentarians, still less with the public. The fact that, as President Putin says all the time, we will destroy our own infrastructure. Well, of course, this is absurd. But in this game, the U.S. often puts out absurd claims, but repeats them often enough that the absurd is the story that sticks. People know, well, it's not probably right, but it's the story that dominates. Because our mainstream media are filled every day with uh, with the. Uh, Senior U.S. officials say no names, no attribution, but that's how the reporting goes. And uh, it's not really reporting, it's stenography. Uh, it's, it's just repeating, not reporting. Uh, it's not even trying to think. So I think it's hard to avoid a discussion about the media, but I would like to circumvent it for today because we could, fill, we could fill a whole, a whole conversation uh, with that. Uh, maybe it's enough, maybe, maybe it suffice to state Western media is privately owned by billionaires who, by the very nature of their positions, have certain interests and will, de will defend certain interests. Yeah? No matter how free we all believe our media is, yeah? there, there is manipulation. I'm interested in that. I'm a, tra I'm, I'm a behavior analyst by training in addition to my occupation in, in IT environment, right? Where, where I want to go with this is there's other hardware on the ground or under a lot of water, yeah? transatlantic internet cables from the US. So I'm just wondering, right? So if I would be Putin and I would assuming some other country has just, you know, damaged my critical infrastructure because also for Russia, the Nord Stream 1 and 2 are critical. You know, there is lots of other stuff down there that is hard if at all, to protect. So you said it before, there is a high potential of escalating this step by step by step. And people don't realize how dependent we all are on these parts of critical infrastructure. It's not only energy, right? Data information is the lifeblood of the new economy. If this is interrupted even slightly, right? I can tell you about data traffic, yeah? A light beam goes seven times, seven times a second throughout the world so that you and me can converse now yeah, through thousands, hundreds of thousands of routers, switches, firewalls. Yeah? A little tiny uh, uh, disruption in this whole chain, you know, not even the bakers can, bread, can bake bread in the morning anymore. Well, we, we, we can even refer to uh, the recent threats that Russia made uh, that because of, uh, they didn't mention Starlink, but Elon Musk's uh, low Earth satellite, uh, uh, satellites that are feeding uh, information on the battlefield for Ukraine, that if uh, this uh, hinders uh, Russia's security, Russia could take them out uh, in space. If we have wars uh, that uh, destroy satellites, again, it's, it's just another example uh, of how things can completely spin out of control. 
And I think it's, uh, if we could go back to the Cuban Missile Crisis, many people will know it, but some won't know it, that even after Kennedy and Khrushchev reached their agreement, there was a, uh, a uh, submarine, a disabled Soviet submarine on the bottom of the Caribbean uh, that was part of the Cuba mission. Uh, it was out of communication. It didn't know that an agreement had been reached. Uh, and when it started to surface because it was disabled, uh, some jackass in the uh, U.S. Uh, military dropped live hand grenades on it rather than depth charges. And so the uh, captain of the submarine thought that they were under live attack and ordered the firing of the nuclear-tipped torpedo, which under U.S. military doctrine would have triggered a full nuclear retaliation by the United States, probably ending the world. And at the last moment, the order of the captain was countermanded by a uh, Communist Party official who was happened to be on the submarine and had authority over the captain, and that's what saved the world in the end. And that was after the political leaders reached agreement. So we have commanders in the battlefield with nuclear weapons. We have so many dangers, so many things that can go wrong, and we think somehow this is under control to have a full proxy war between the U.S. and Russia, each with more than 1,600 deployed nuclear weapons? I don't think so. I fully agree. Um, Professor Sachs, if we now switch over and have a look at why Ukraine is so important for both for the U.S., but also for, uh, for Russia, right? Let's not go into who invaded Russia already a couple of times through Ukraine, right? Um, have a look. Let's have a look at what Brzezinski, Brzezinski already wrote in 1997 yeah, in his uh, The Grand Chessboard. We can also have a look at what William Burns, the CIA director, wrote in his memoirs, which is about two years old, where he explicitly wrote that he, William Burns, by the way, was a U.S. ambassador for many years in, in, uh, in Moscow, right? He wrote that Ukraine is the reddest of red lines for Putin and his whole inner circle, right? And he, and this goes already back because he advised successive U.S. governments on this perspective already for I don't know how many, how many years. So this is not something new. So what's, what's your take on why is Ukraine so important for both the U.S. and for Russia? Well, it's, it's uh, vital for Russia because it's uh, on the border. Uh, and uh, that's period. Uh, the same way that uh, the U.S. would not uh, much uh, cotton a China-Mexico military alliance, uh, which is, uh, you know, probably the closest analogy one, one, could, uh, one could have. Why is it crucial for the United States? It's not. Uh, it's part of a U.S. game, but it's not crucial. Uh, what Brzezinski said is it's a geographical pivot. He said, he who controls Ukraine will control uh, Eurasia. Uh, the idea was that if uh, Ukraine is firmly in the NATO camp, uh, then Russia is at best a, a regional power, but not even that. It, it can no longer project power uh, in the eastern Mediterranean. It loses its hold on the Black Sea. It's basically bottled up uh, in uh, Asia. And, he, and Brzezinski said, so this is a, you know, part of the, the grand chessboard. Uh, and he said, you know, the U.S. has a good shot at this, but it, what it should do is avoid driving Russia and China together, you know, but that's so unlikely. But that's exactly what U.S. policy uh, has, has actually done. So the U.S. views this as a geopolitical chessboard. The Russia views this as a national security issue that is absolutely the red line. Well, if you take these two, this is an explosive, explosive combination. And it's been explosive for decades now. But it was already in 2008 when George W. Bush Jr. incredibly irresponsibly pushed NATO Bucharest. to say that uh, Ukraine would become a member at the Bucharest summit. And the next day, it happened that 
the following day was the <laughs> NATO Russia meeting <coughs> that year, and uh, Putin told Bush, "If you do this, we take Crimea." Be our, the Russian fleet has been in Crimea since 1783. Thank you very much. And so what the U.S. was proposing was incredibly provocative. It was, like we started, tantamount to saying, okay, we're going to make military bases uh, in Cuba, tantamount to the Soviet Union saying that. The analogy is not perfect, but in any event, for Russia, the red line was absolutely clear. It Things went to a simmer in 2010, 2011, 2012, because there was a pro-Russian president of Ukraine, Yanukovych, who said wisely, Ukraine will be neutral. Now, neutrality keeps Ukraine from being the battleground between two nuclear superpowers. That's the smart position. But then Yanukovych was overthrown at the end of 2013 and early 2014 by a kind of insurrection in which the U.S. played its role. We're going we to come there. Exact, we, yeah, Professor, okay, fine. I have, it on, I have it on my list. I don't okay, want to be good. on the same list of people who interrupt you. I, I, I'm, I hate no, to do that. No, not at yeah? all. Not but at it's, all. It's, it's on my list, yeah? So... <laughs> In, in regards to Ukraine, right? So when it was proposed in 2008 on the NATO summer, sum, summit in, uh, in Bucharest, yeah, uh, Angela Merkel from Germany and France, they were actually smart enough to realize that this proposal is a danger also for Europe, right? So there was Euro at least partly European opposition to that proposal. <coughs> Nevertheless, they, they proceeded, right? So coming back to the overall statement, what I mentioned at the very beginning from Lord Ismay, which was the first NATO Secretary General, right? So this this kind of, you know, uh, infamous uh, statement, keep the Soviet Union out, the Americans in, and the Germans down, right? If you if you verify this statement on, on, on the internet, you get a lot of Lord Eastman restated. So throughout the last 60, 70 years, many uh, politicians in various uh, positions have used that statement, yeah? One that stuck out to me, and he's not a, uh, he's not a politician, but he was very influ influential, is the former Stratford chairman, George Friedman, not to confuse with Milton Friedman, of course, right? Who was, who was the founder of the world's, well, I'm, st I'm, I'm, uh, I'm stating this here, the world's leading geopolitical intelligence platform. Yeah. But, so George Friedman, with his company, of course, were quite uh, influential in regards to US military influence, right? And he said in a speech at the Chicago Council on Global Affairs, he stated that it's the primary interest for the U.S. to stop a coalition between Germany and Russia because the combination of German know-how with Russian resources, of course, would be a very potent combination in terms of economic rising of Europe or even Eurasia, right? It's, a, it's an interesting statement because uh, when I was advisor to Russia, I thought exactly that German technology and Russian resources, and by the way, very intelligent and well-educated people, uh, was a potent combination that could lead to the economic rise of Russia. And I thought, that's exactly what we want. Not what we're trying to prevent, but exactly what we want. That's the goal of economic development. So it's an interesting statement, which I hadn't heard, but it shows, you know, if you think like an, an American unipolar neocon, then the game is keep others down. If you think like I do and like I think we should, it is how do we get mutual gain? Uh, and it's not, economic development is not a zero-sum game. Uh, it's uh, something that absolutely is to be promoted, in my opinion, also with China and so forth. But to a strategist that's interested in a unipolar U.S. world, the game is prevent the rise of your competitors. It's a very dangerous game. Other countries don't like their rise to be prevented. Yeah, absolutely. Professor Sachs, thank you so much for joining a second time. We were running out of time yesterday. Appreciate it to, to see you again. Pleasure. Thank you. I have a couple of dates. 1991, 2008, 2014, 
right? Let's start with uh, 1991. And I would like to go to a, a statement that has been uh, pop, uh, propagated throughout the media and throughout the years. Yeah, That was the, the statement to Gorbachev that NATO will not encroach an inch into the NATO, uh, sorry, into the former Warsaw Pact Soviet Union sphere of influence, right? Now, what can you tell us about this statement? Gorbachev was uh, offering to disband uh, the Warsaw Pact uh, military alliance of the Soviet Union and uh, also to uh, entertain the reunification of Germany. And in that context, uh, Hans Dietrich Genscher and James Baker III, representing uh, the German government and the U.S. government, were absolutely explicit uh, that uh, the West would not take advantage of this end of the Cold War, the military end of the Cold War, uh, by expanding NATO. They said it. They said it on many, many occasions. It was very clear. Gorbachev said that it was uh, extremely important. And uh, there was a, a long documentary record of all of this. True. And I followed your advice. I had a look at the National Security Ad uh, Archive from the George Washington University. And even the folder that you mentioned is correct. NATO expansion, what not, what uh, Gorbachev heard. There can be no doubt. It's all, it's all documented, right? It, well, it, it's, it's absolutely uh, the refusal of the mainstream media to present uh, any serious discussion of these matters that is the real problem. The, the goal of our government is uh, historical amnesia. Uh, I, I think uh, Orwell put it right when he said, uh, uh, he who controls the present controls the past, he who controls the past controls the future. Uh, so uh, the, the goal is control the past. Don't tell what really happened. But yeah. it's, it's quite clear what really happened. Yeah, and it's documented. Uh, absolutely. Moving on to 2008, to the NATO summit in Bucharest. Now, I watched a couple of uh, podcasts from the former Finnish Prime Minister Alexander Stubb, right? And he said he was there in 2008 in Bucharest, and it was never really proposed that Georgia and Ukraine should definitely join the join NATO. However, he said uh, President Bush favored that position. So, for someone who was involved as you were, what's your what's your comment on it? Well, the Bucharest. 2008 statement says that Georgia and Ukraine will join NATO, period. <laughs> It's yeah. very clear. What happened was that uh, Bush uh, pushed this. The Europeans knew better, so they didn't offer uh, some kind of uh, roadmap immediately. But Bush pushed through in the Bucharest statement at the end that Ukraine and Georgia will join NATO. And that became U.S. policy, it became NATO policy, endlessly repeated since then. There's no ambiguity about it. What is, what is ironic and interesting is that European leaders knew very well then that this was uh, absolutely provocative. But they don't speak in public. They're afraid of the United States. And so, unfortunately, the European public doesn't even hear from its own leaders the real situation about things like this. Yeah. And what was put in response then and since then on that uh, on that fact? The day after this declaration was the scheduled NATO-Russia meeting. Uh, so actually, Putin was in Bucharest uh, the next day, and he said to Bush, if you push NATO expansion to Ukraine, we take back uh, uh, Crimea. <laughs> It was very clear. Putin has been completely against this, as was uh, Yeltsin, as was Gorbachev. The whole issue of NATO enlargement has been a provocation uh, now for 30 years. Yeah, I find it sometimes astounding. We, you know, paint uh, Putin now as the new Hitler. Not so long ago, it was uh, Saddam Hussein. But actually, Putin said for a very long time what he's going to do, and he kept, <laughs> I, always, I always wanted to say he kept his word. I mean, that, that's not the right phrase here, right? Well, I think I think there's a, a, an even more important point that he was absolutely pro-European uh, at the beginning of his presidency, had good, even cordial relations with European leaders. I, I know many of them, and they've told me about their relations with Putin. Uh, so the idea that somehow 
uh, yes, we're facing this uh, irreconcilable foe. It neglects uh, the whole uh, way that uh, the Cold War was rebuilt. Um, and many people warned the United States that the path that the U.S. was on was going to recreate the Cold War. The most stark warning of this was George Kennan, our greatest historian statesman of U.S.-Russian relations, the post-World War II architect of the containment policy, though it became a military strategy, which Kennan did not want. He wanted a cultural and political strategy. But in any event, Kennan said in 1997, this NATO enlargement is the beginning of the new Cold War with Russia. Yeah. One last statement from Alexander Stubb, again, former uh, Finnish prime minister. And I listened to it three times just to ensure I didn't miss anything. He said, literally, NATO, NATO never, never attacked, attacked another, another country. country. I was a little bit surprised about this statement. What can you tell us about it? Well, it's false. Uh, and uh, NATO bombed Belgrade for 41 days in 1999. Uh, and uh, Putin took some attention to that because Serbia uh, was an ally of Russia and NATO without UN approval, but because Madeleine Albright and Richard Holbrook and uh, Bill Clinton said so, uh, bombed uh, Belgrade. Then uh, NATO... Uh, bombed uh, Muammar Gaddafi, uh, uh, his regime, out of existence uh, in 2011. Uh, ag again, completely contrary to the purposes of the UN Security Council resolution about Libya, which was about protecting civilian populations, not overthrowing governments. So it's just a typical Western propaganda. These lines are repeated. They are not scrutinized in the mainstream media. This is what politicians do for a living. They repeat uh, this kind of uh, statement uh, without uh, and any uh, uh, commitment to, to the truth, I'm afraid. Yeah, I think you said the crucial thing here, uh, without UN approval, right? So technically, by international law, any war of aggression, but especially any war of aggression without UN approval is the illegal war right yeah if if it's uh, done under article if, if it's done under the uh, un charter by uh, approval of the security council it uh, probably is in conformity with international law almost by definition but if it's done without that uh, and it's not an act of self-defense and absolutely neither the serbian bombing nor the libyan bombing were acts of self-defense it's against international law Now, switching over to 2014, and I collected a bit of information in regards, in regards to the Maidan revolution, right? So for those who don't know, uh, the pro-Russian uh, president uh, Yanukovych was deposed in 2014 in, quite, in, what, in what looked like a bloody uprising revolt, right? Now, I have a number of research papers from academics who analyzed what really happened there. Yeah, just to give you a couple of numbers. Yeah, they analyzed 1,500 videos of live social media and TV broadcasts, 150 gigabytes of news reports from more than 100 different journalists, 5,000 uh, photos, 30 gigabytes of publicly available radio intercepts of the snipers and their commanders. Well, for the West, it was portrayed as this bottom-up revolution. Seems, according to those uh, researchers, This academic investigation concludes that the massacre was rationally <laughs> planned and carried out with the goal of overthrow of the government and seizure of power. So there was not an accidental happening, and especially the fact that those snipers were shooting at the security forces and at the population leaves a, a huge question mark in regards <coughs> to what happened there. So what, what's your point, point of view in regards to the Maidan revolution? We know there were mass public protests Uh, but we also know that senior U.S. officials were stirring those protests, some in, in a very direct way. Our uh, Senator John McCain, for example, went and spoke to the crowds, cheering them on, uh, as if some foreign politician came to Trump's uh, crowd on January 6, 2021 and said, oh, go for it. Uh, in other words, uh, America was blatantly inserting itself into this, but there was a lot of 
behind the scenes role of the United States. One of uh, that was captured uh, on, uh, on the phone of Victoria Newland, who at the time was the Assistant Secretary of State for European and Eurasian Affairs. And she was uh, captured uh, on a, a phone call, probably by uh, Russian uh, intelligence and subsequently made public, uh, saying who was going to be in the next government. Uh, the U.S. was engaging in participation in, in a regime change activity. This is not to deny the public protest, but it's to say that the U.S. played a hidden hand in a lot of this. I, I know that uh, firsthand that, that it did because I saw some NGOs, what they were doing, U.S. NGOs uh, stirring uh, the Maidan, supporting uh, the insurrection and so on. So I think there's a lot of U.S. meddling and Putin said, well, this was a coup that was led by the United States. Uh, I don't know if it can be exactly characterized this way. It was a an insurrection absolutely stirred in part by the United States. But like all of these events, U.S. operations are covert. Uh, everything is... Uh, is therefore subject to lies uh, when it comes to the public presentation. We're never told as American citizens what our government is actually doing uh, in reality. None of it's explained. Uh, our government officials lie rampantly all the time. And um, you have to ferret this out. Those academic studies uh, you cite are part of that process. Uh, I know academics that have spent years on uh, trying to analyze what happened and, in fact, you know, where the snipers came from and uh, how uh, we blamed uh, the Yanukovych government for things that, according to these academics, absolutely was from the opposing side. So we should understand, and I think in many uh, people outside the United States, I would say, unfortunately, most people in the United States do not understand what the CIA does, how it operates, its covert actions, and not just the CIA, but many agencies of the U.S. government. They do things secretly to steer the politics of other countries. And as soon as Yanukovych was chased out, we recognized a uh, a new regime, an insurrectionist regime, not saying, no, 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 that's not the Constitution. There was an agreement, uh, President Yanukovych is president, and there should be new elections down the road. No, the United States immediately recognized the government that it wanted. So even on the surface, the behavior is absolutely inappropriate. Uh, um, American officials, I think rightly, go wild when foreign governments try to intervene in the U.S., but the U.S. does it absolutely routinely in other places. And that double standard is not satisfactory because it puts us in great danger. Yeah, in the long term. And it's also at least since 2014 that uh, the U.S. Uh, finances and trains uh, Ukraine armed forces, right? I, I, have, I have seen different, different numbers, somewhere in the range of between 40 billion U.S. dollars and 60 U billion U.S. dollars. That's probably too too high a number. Uh, it's probably in the billions, not the tens of billions, before 2022. Now it's, of course, in the tens of billions. Yeah. Okay. Now, you being an economist, I would like to spend the time that we have still also to discuss a little bit economic. Yeah. So the first question would have, would would be, of course, the absolute mayhem that happened in Russia after, let's say, 1991, when uh, Yeltsin dissolved the Soviet Union. This, uh, how shall I describe this best? This this free for all capitalism, which was, which invaded Russia basically overnight, and the consequences from that time. How do you think can this this absolute pillar, pillage? of the Russian economy be related to what's happening today? Well, first of all, I, I think it's uh, better to say that uh, the Soviet system uh, collapsed uh, in the 1980s, and it was based on uh, top-down 
very brutal power. It was a command economy, so-called. And Gorbachev was an extremely decent man and a, a real reformer, and he didn't want the commands. Uh, so he took off the commands, but a command economy without the commands doesn't function. And in the second half of the 1980s, the economy went into a financial crisis. Uh, oil prices were very low internationally, and that was the one source of foreign exchange. Uh, the government borrowed short term, uh, faced a big uh, debt crisis on uh, loans that it took on during the 1980s. So by 1989-90, the system was uh, in uh, a, a terminal state of affairs, and there were dislocation, shortages, falling output, many terrible problems, uh, failing living standards, life expectancy had been falling for many, many years. The end of the Soviet Union uh, meant much more because uh, first, it, it really was a kind of revolution, of course. Second, it was the collapse of even the basic exchange relations within the 15 uh, regions of the Soviet Union, which became the 15 successor states of uh, the post-Soviet period. And so you couldn't trade, move goods. Uh, it, there was a complete breakdown of uh, all of the division of labor, so-called, that was part of the Soviet economy. So it was a real mess. And, of course, there was a contestation for power. And in that context, I was an advisor for two years, 1992 and 93, and my what they wanted from me and what I wanted to help deliver was some financial support from the outside to help stabilize the situation so that it wouldn't get completely out of hand. That was both my assignment and I think what they hoped that I could do something about because when I was advisor to Poland in 1989, I did deliver a package of financial support for Poland, which made a huge difference for Poland's ability to make the transformation. But when it came to Russia, every one of my ideas was rejected by the White House. Basically, they didn't want to help Russia. This is absolutely clear. Uh, Russia was an enemy, and uh, why the hell would you want to help Russia? So I, as an economist and as someone who uh, believes in cooperation and finding a peaceful way forward, wanted to help. First, I wanted to help the Soviet Union. I was asked by uh, Mikhail Gorbachev's economic team to help. Uh, of course, uh, the U.S. was completely uninterested in that. Then, uh, after the dissolution of the Soviet Union, I thought, well, maybe there'll be an opening now. Clearly, there's no more Cold War. But uh, the U.S. leaders of the time were really stupid uh, and nasty. Uh, and that's the beginning of our hardcore neocon era. Uh, we had it a long time beforehand because the U.S. has been engaged in regime change and overthrows and militarization for a very long time. But from 1992 onward, we've had a neoconservative foreign policy, which is aimed at American uh, full-spectrum dominance, they call it, power uh, that is unchallenged in all parts of the world. It's a, a figment of their imagination. <laughs> it's a dangerous mirage, but it's actually the, the aim. And uh, in the context of Russia in the early 1990s, uh, they had no intention of doing anything to try to help the situation. Uh, Professor Sachs, I have one last topic, if I may. Sure. And this uh, is in regards to BRICS. Uh, BRICS is in the news lately because apparently Saudi Arabia is is flirting with the thought of joining together with some other uh, with some other countries, Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa, 41.5% of the world population. It's quite a big chunk. 24% of the global GDP, 16% of global trade, right? Now, this is especially interesting right now because there is this, I don't want to say global trend, but there is a trend in certain countries to de-dollarize, yeah? to find another solution of the US dollar, especially the petrodollar, as the world reserve currency, right? So for you as economist, what's your view here? Can this be successful? If so, how long would it take? What would be the impact for uh, for the US and for the global uh, uh, economy? I know I'm asking you compound questions now, but uh, please go ahead. Basically, uh, 
the uh, role of the U.S. dollar is one part of U.S. Uh, global power. Uh, the dollar is used for settling transactions. It's uh, used for uh, borrowing and lending. It's used for the denomination of transactions. It's the key global reserve currency. So a significant proportion, 50 or 60 percent of international trade are settled in dollars, and that means really settled through the banking system that uses dollars. The U.S. has uh, militarized or politicized this system, uh, especially in the last 10 years. It's done it in a number of countries, basically uh, by uh, using uh, its power to deny adversary regimes uh, of their access to this dollar-based system. Uh, examples of that are Iran and Venezuela. But in 2022, after the Soviet invasion, the Russian invasion, excuse me, uh, on February 24th, uh, the U.S. and uh, its allies uh, basically uh, blocked Russia from uh, most of uh, um, the use of uh, the dollar-based banking system and uh, the United States government led the seizure of Russia's foreign exchange reserves. Really incredible, uh, just freezing the bank balances uh, that are Russia's bank balances. And uh, the numbers vary, but something on the order of $300 billion of the government's foreign exchange reserves seized. Well, it doesn't, doesn't take a, a PhD in economics to know if you uh, don't see eye to eye with the U.S. government, don't leave your reserves uh, in uh, dollars. Uh, and by the way, this followed the seizure of Afghanistan's $8 billion of foreign exchange reserves as well. So basically, uh, the U.S. has turned the dollar into a geopolitical instrument. But there are other ways to transact. You can use other currencies uh, and uh, you can <coughs> use third parties and you can uh, barter in certain ways and so on. And to my mind, what the U.S. is doing is uh, undermining the role of the dollar, which has given the U.S. certain financial advantages. And I think in 10 years, even before then, uh, Russia, India, the BRICS, as you say, other countries will move to other kinds of payments. This will be accelerated also by using uh, currencies like the digital renminbi, which is uh, already on the way. And much of this is actually in a pretty advanced state of transformation, Russia, China, India, Saudi Arabia are already using non-dollar transactions for uh, a lot of uh, their international uh, trade right now, and the trend will surely continue. The United States cannot continue to uh, make these kinds of unilateral interventions, which I, I think are pretty outrageous, actually, I have to say. I'm not, uh, not a fan of them at all. Um, but it can't do it and expect that the role of the dollar remains as preeminent uh, as it has been in the past. It, it won't be the case. Yeah. Coincidence or not, the last two heads of state who tried to sell oil against something else, then uh, the dollar both dead. Libya's uh, Muammar Gaddafi and Saddam Hussein are both dead. Yeah, yeah I, I think uh, it, the U.S. was after them for many reasons, uh, but... Uh, what I do think is uh, that there will be alternative ways to make settlements. Yeah, agree. Professor, thank you very much. I have one last thing. Yes. Noam, Noam Chomsky and Professor Mersheimer, I hope I pronounce, I pronounce yep. his na name correctly. Yeah? So how does your view differentiate from Noam Chomsky's or Professor Mersheimer, Mersheimer's view? I see a lot of overlap, right? Yeah, when it, when it comes to understanding what's happening in Ukraine right now, there, there's a tremendous amount of overlap. In fact, uh, Professor Mearsheimer was one of the leading voices uh, early on saying this NATO enlargement is a provocation. 
uh, and we need to understand provocations and not make such provocations. Uh, and so in this sense, uh, Professor Chomsky, Professor Mersheimer, and myself are really on the same wavelength on this issue. Okay. Any other names? Any other academics on the devil? Well, I, there are others, but um, the, the three of us have, uh, <laughs> the Ukrainians have not liked what we've been saying. You know, we're trying to point out some historical context to this. And by the way, I, I would just add, it's very sad for me. I, many uh, in Ukraine, in, in the government and elsewhere, think that somehow I'm uh, taking President Putin's line. It's It's absolutely not the point. The point I'm making is that the United States maneuvered and, sadly, the Ukrainian government accepted getting in the middle of a proxy war. And if I were uh, in Ukraine's position and what I tried to warn them and told them, don't fall into this trap of uh, a being the battleground between Russia and the United States, you'll end up like Afghanistan in Uh, Europe and uh, by Afghanistan, I mean the United States was there blowing up the place for decades, and then one day it left, and the place uh, has been completely ravaged and turned to rubble and uh, every kind of damage. And that's after the U.S. engagement from actually 1979 onward. Uh, it's not just from 2001 when we had an open invasion. It's typical for the U.S. that the CIA went into Afghanistan in 1979 to give funding to jihadists that later on would become al-Qaeda and the Taliban. <laughs> This is no joke. Uh, with the idea of uh, trying to precipitate a Soviet invasion of Afghanistan. Uh, so the kind of recklessness of these games by the U.S., uh, leaves countries in ruins and Afghanistan is a victim and sad to say Ukraine is a victim too unless we move to negotiations. It's always the people who suffer no matter in Afghanistan any other pro proxy war it's the people who suffer on a massive scale. That's the point of proxy wars isn't it? That's that's what the US is fighting. Till the last Ukrainian, yeah. We will fight, as the US will fight, yeah. till the last Ukrainian, yeah. Professor Sachs, thank you so much for your, for your second contribution to, uh, to our conversation. Great to be with you. I wish you all the best, and I wish we had more critical voices like yours. We'll continue this discussion, and hopefully, uh, I, I hope uh, that people in Europe especially understand what their ally is doing and how it's uh, no good for the world. So we need a different direction. Yeah. Professor Sachs, thank you very much. Greetings to Vienna. Thank you. Bye-bye. Goodbye. Are you still here? Good for you. So how can we make sense of a world balancing on the edge of a nuclear Armageddon in the 21st century? It's really hard to wrap your mind around the situation we're in. How did we get here? Whom can we believe? Can we separate history from what is happening today? Can we separate the context from the event? I think there's only one way for you to find out. And that's to educate yourself. Don't believe me. Don't believe anyone. Verify for yourself. One of the advantages of the digital age is that good information is out there. You just have to find it. Educate yourself till you have enough knowledge. I mean true knowledge, not opinions, right? To see through all the fake mirrors and smoke screens that are being put up to manipulate your thoughts and feelings. Because that's exactly what's happening. Any student of social science knows how easy humans can be manipulated. A good example is the Maidan discussion in the, in the interview. Why else would companies spend billions on PR? Our knowledge about the inner workings of our minds has increased in tandem with some new technological innovations that were considered impossible only a decade ago. But so does the potential of the exploitation. Remember the Cambridge Analytica data scandal? It was coined a data scandal, but while big data was definitely a part of it, actually it was a scandal about large-scale manipulation of individuals. 
They did this by exploiting amazingly accurate psychological profiles that were created by tech companies based on user behavior on social networks. A couple of clicks and AI knows you better than you know yourself. And that's literally true. Keep this in mind when you read your news feeds. It doesn't matter what platform you use. What you get presented there is tailored specifically for you and nobody else. And it serves only the interests of the highest bidder. In the context of war, political upheaval or even elections, the highest bidder may not just be an ordinary company. Remember, and it sounds almost like a cliche these days, if the product is free, you are the product. So what I would recommend is to really question your assumptions, because they may not be your own. I know that's not easy. It takes effort, practice and a level of commitment that many people will not be able to invest. But acquiring a new skill set does take time. It does take dedication and not everyone can do what it takes. If you can come this far, you will be one of the few and you will be ahead of the pack. Okay, and that's it for today. Consider liking and subscribing if you appreciate the content, it costs you nothing and helps this channel. Thank you for watching.